olive oil sprinkle. Today we're standing at the edge of a seepage bog with Dr. Bruce Means. Bruce, what exactly is a seepage bog? They're, they, there are many different kinds, are wonderful things in Florida and the coastal plain of this country. We came to this particular one uh, to sort of start the story. They're essentially wet sites that seep, water oozes from the ground, and depending on, as we'll see, the interaction of fire and water, they have a, a structure going from a grassy meadow with carnivorous plants downslope into a, a hardwood uh, shrub, evergreen shrub zone, and eventually on into a hardwood streamside community. But the, the, the herb bog, as the grass zone is called, and the shrub bog, as the, as the shrubby zone is called, are exquisite natural treasures in this state. Um, this slope you see behind us is a good model for which um, we, we can compare other sites we'll see. Notice that on the top of the slope, there is a stand of well-developed pines, and this is the native longleaf pine of the coastal plain, one of the not too many remaining stands of it. It grades down slope in the zone that we're in here, or that we're right at the upper edge of. You can clearly see it's a grassy meadow, very few pine trees in it, and then abruptly, further down slope, there is a wall of green vegetation, small leaf plants. They turn out to be um, uh, plants that don't shed their leaves, they're evergreen. And then beyond that, you can see that there's another community of trees developed in there. That happens to be cypress and, it, and another pine, um, indicating a moisture gradient that is lined up along a slope. The slope, the the, the slope kind of controls the amount of moisture. Where the moisture first originates is from rain that falls down on the sand here. And, under the pines. Right, under these pines. Remember, it's sandy, and it has to be sandy to receive water. Instead of water running off downslope on the surface of the ground, um, it is captured by the deep sand by sinking down into it. It's so porous it can't run off. But then it moves slowly laterally as well as down until if there is a slope that intersects the little water table, then it can seep out along the slope, as you see, see right here. Hence the name. Right, seep. And then the water is, at that point, uh, able to slowly move downslope into the stream bottom. It's really, seepage bogs are really valley phenomena. They, they are where water can seep when the ground is porous enough, downslope near the valley bottom. Now, it turns out, however, that first off, you have to have water to have one. but if that was all we had was just the moisture here, all of those hardwoods you see there in the foreground, the evergreen shrubbery, would seed this way. And you can see a lot of the outliers, a lot of colonizers here, they would march upslope and eventually go all the way up into the longleaf community. And over time, the hardwood forest would grow up. And you would not have the bog site, nor would you eventually have the longleaf site. Do you know why? Probably fire. Yes, indeed. Fire is the big answer. Fires, of course, as you know, are native to the coastal plain. They burn through the coastal plain naturally. Indians uh, use fire a little bit and maybe increase the frequency somewhat. But all of this thing we're looking at today started naturally with lightning fires. And we've got problems today, though. The natural fire cycle does not burn because of impediments to broad fires like roads, towns, agricultural fields, and the like. So in order that our bogs not be invaded by and swamped out by the, quote, oh, that was a bad metaphor, but <laughs> um, drowned out or otherwise shaded out by these hardwoods, we have to artificially bring fire back to keep them pruned back. They're fire sensitive. Um, let's walk down this gradient further into the wetter part of the okay. zone and we'll very carefully dissect it because the changes that occur, occur very rapidly with the small uh, changes in water. Okay. Notice how rapidly this gradient changes, Carol Lee. Um, the presence of moisture is really a controlling factor here. Now, right now, our feet are sort of a little spongy. It started just about uh, two or three feet up there. And as it slowly trickles down slope, of course, it gets more in volume and more permanent by reason of that. 
causing zonation to occur. Now, what defines the real high interest of these seepage bogs are these interesting carnivorous plants. Probably our area, North Florida, has more species of all kinds of them than any other equal-sized area in the world. Mm. The pitcher plants that we're looking at, uh, we'll see four of them today. This one is Saracenia flava. See, the leaf is rolled up. There's water down there. There's even a little insect in that. Oh. Flies and gnats and Oops. beetles are, he went on down. It fell in. Uh, they're attracted to it. It has a, a really nice odor, like a flower. And if you'll see down inside that, it also has um, a sort of a silvery shine in there. Well, those are little tiny hairs that point downward into the plant and prevent insects from crawling back because they have to walk against the hairs pointing downward. Anyway, eventually they die and they then decompose in the water in the bottom of it. And the plant takes up the nutrients that the animal produces um, through its um, leaf walls. It's thought that the insectivory that these plants um, have evolved here is an adaptation to what are basically poorly, soils that are poor in nutrition. Uh -huh. See, this is sand. Now remember, that's a big important thing about these bogs. They're developed on deep sands. Well, sand is sort of like, you know, little chips of glass, which are relatively inert. They don't have much in the way of uh, goodies that are chemically um, dissolving from them to give any soil nutrition. So these plants actually make their own fertilizer. And it's not just pitcher plants, by the way, but in a minute, we'll walk a little further down the gradient, and I'll show you some other carnivorous plants of another family, the Drosseras, the Sundews. What is this? Oh, this is the seed head of a flower. The petals have fallen off. Uh, these are the sepals, and right back behind here is the uh, ovary. That's where the seeds are, are developing. So and it's here, actually a flowering plant. Yes, oh, absolutely. Um, these, uh, by the way, also grow, though you notice in little clumps, they're, um, the clumps are probably, well, they're, they're one plant, they have a rhizome, and they could be very old. They could be as much as a century or more old. Are these plants protected under Florida law? Are they? Um, most pitcher plants and, and other things like orchids, which we're going to see a little later, are protected in some measure, either federally or at the state level. So we don't pick these. <laughs> now, slowly, um, let's move a little further down the zone. And this movement now is, is a matter of inches in elevation. You know, it's a, it's a few feet in, in linear distance. But right in here, if I can get my shadow out of your way, look at these. These oh, little plants so are called sundews. And, um, you see the little hairs on the ends of the leaves have stickiness on them. And there's a flower. Little, yeah. It's another group of flowering plants. And um, they also have a different way, of course, of trapping the insect. The insect gets caught on the stickiness that grow on those little hairs. And actually, they, they slowly will, after an insect is entrapped in some, the other hairs will sort of roll toward it and further entrap the insect, which dies, and then the leaf takes up the decomposing nutrients that leach out of the animal. So um, plants are becoming, <laughs> some of them, quite interesting predators, even on animals. And it's a wonderful story of how uh, a group, several different groups of plants have learned, or let's say have come to exploit animals in order to uh, accommodate to the new, poor nutrition in these soils. Okay, watch this zone shift now. It's uh, really changing here. A lot of dense grasses for a moment. I, w I sh probably should have stopped at this sundew. It's much nicer in size where my shadow is. And, uh, and enormous blossom stalk. Notice more than that, though. You see how the ground now is cracking and drying? All right. Just because bogs have water in them does not mean they're always wet. That's a, a sort of a complicated story, but some of them have more water in them more often and some have less, um, and that has some effect on the zonation. But the presence of water primarily is the first thing that's required in the bog. Now, as we come down here, 
We're only going another inch or two lower in elevation, and we're starting to get into the, the shrub zone. But the reason right. the shrub zone is here, look, you can see it. You can actually feel it. Look at these plants. Now, you see the, the mud on the leaves? What would that indicate to you? That there's been water. There has been water here. In fact, one of our rains recently has caused the water to stand here for a while and then evaporate. Well, this has more water in it, obviously, than just where we were because there's no mud on those leaves. At this point, being wetter, when the occasional summer fire burned down in here naturally, usually by the time it got here, it would go out. Now, these plants are the outliers of the hardwood community. This little shrub is called St. John's wort, and it's right in this zone. Immediately next to it is a zone where the tai tai plants begin to occur and notice when we you can see it's very beautifully sculpted they're mm -hmm. short and small outside and it's rounded up as you get further in well that's fire activity uh, in some years fire will run further in there so that and it'll kill the ones that are further out in this way this direction and of course that means that these plants are always younger than those and thereby you have the sculptured effect because the bigger the plants uh, the older they are and the further they are in away from into the protected zone but look right here just to the right we're in here's a cypress sneeze as a matter of fact but look at this oh, look isn't this beautiful that. this is another pitcher plant and this beautifully illustrates this zonation this one is the parrot beak it's called Saracenia sitacina and you can see it's a little it's got a little sort of a parrot bill on the uh, leaf uh, many of them lie flat on the ground. Um, a very good local botanist has sort of got the idea that when they're flat on the ground, Bill Platt has figured that these might serve as little drift fences. That is, insects will crawl along until they hit the, uh, the, the side of the plant, and then they'll walk this way along the leaf. And then look, you see what, where, they, where they wind up going? <laughs> as they walk along the little walkway, they find a little hole there. And uh, there even may be an odor emanating from that. They then fall into that. And again, this plant does the same thing that its relative, the other pitcher plant does. It uh, takes up the nutrients that are leached out when the plant, uh, the animal dies. And is this the And seed this is the seed head, one? right, the old flower. Those are the, those are the petals. They're very beautiful when they're in bloom a month or so earlier than this. Now, let's, uh, let's keep going down this gradient a little bit. Just with another few steps, we'll be inside this shrub zone. Now notice very quickly, as we come in, it thins out. Well, there's a fundamental uh, ecological phenomenon. It, uh, it's leggier in here. In other words, it opens up. We can stand up, but it wasn't there. Do you know why that is? Sunlight, perhaps. That's, of course that's open to the raw sun. So all the plants, you know, they're trying to grow that way. The fire keeps them hemmed back. And so there's this big wall of, of uh, photosynthesizing leaves. But as we come in where the leaves now are over top of us, there aren't many leaves and twigs and stems down low. So it opens up. Now, where we are on this gradient is in the, we're almost now in the hardwood zone or the, the stream forest itself which is bounded by this little evergreen shrub zone. And uh, you can see right here that water is more commonly standing than it has any other spot further up this gradient, although it's pretty well evaporated here. Even now, so. is that grass zone the end of the gradient? Well, it, it is actually sort of intermediate. Where do you think the water will flow from this point? What would be the ultimate destination? The ocean, I imagine. Exactly. We are really, we happen to have chosen the head of a little drainage here. We, the pine community is on the drainage divide, and the water seeps down, hits the water table, then laterally seeps from the slope and begins moving on the surface of the ground down slope. At this point, a stream begins to develop, and then from here, it gets bigger and bigger, develops a floodplain and begins to meander, and it, this particular stream joins up with our famous Apalachicola River, and that, of course, ultimately takes the water to the sea. And the cycle's closed again when the evaporation brings rainwater back up here. And that's it. 
Um, the bog story, though, is a little more elaborate than this. There are two more things we should look at. Let's go from here to see one of these bogs. Let's test my idea about the relationship that fire has in the hardwoods. I'll take you to one, a bog that has had no fire for a while, and you'll see how it's been encroached and invaded by this evergreen zone. And the hardwoods would follow that. Then after that, we'll finish by going back to the bog itself in the natural regime, the fire regime, and we'll take that slope and we'll make the slope very, very gentle and when we do that, the zones spread out in, in their width. And because we're here near Wilma and Sumatra, uh, we have some exquisite bogs locally known as savannas, a, a special kind of seepage savanna, and we'll pick up our story and end it there. All right. Now we're standing on a nice little bog on Florida Road 20, about a mile to the west of Hosford. And as you can see off to my left, over this recently plowed area, it's a classic example of what happens to a, an herb bog when the fire cycle has been suppressed. The shrubs in the foreground have invaded it. These are mostly Cliftonia, little, little um, hardwoods uh, that fringe these. This is, these they are the predominant species that occur in the, er, the uh, shrub zone. You'll see the grass zone underneath is still obvious. It hasn't been totally shaded out yet, but it's on the way. Let's walk over okay. into it. The um, uniqueness of this particular bog is that it contains one of the pitcher plants found only in the panhandle. Sorry about this muck. <laughs> okay. Now, now you can tell what the bog is all about. It is boggy and wet, the water standing about an inch up my shoe. And um, just inside here, you can tell by the diameters of these little slash pine that um, it's not a particularly nutritious site because it's uh, a lot of deep sand with this water trickling over it. And the little pines uh, don't have much in the way of nutrients. But there are a lot of plants in here that survive in this uh, very wet community and build up a muck on top of the sand. This muck decomposes and is highly acidic. The acidity has a lot to do with, with um, the kinds of plants you'll find in a site like this. There is that beautiful white-leafed pitcher plant. That's fantastic. I've never seen one like that. A minute ago, I, I, in my excitement, I aired the Panhandle, Florida, is contains most of the known populations of the species. They do occur a little bit into Alabama uh, around the fringe of the Panhandle, but mostly Panhandle, Florida, contains it. And we're in the about the easternmost locality, so this is the first place going west out of Tallahassee that you can see this pitcher plant. And years ago, when Florida State was uh, not a coeducational school. The earlier botanists there used to frequent this a lot of times in their field classes. It's a famous bog, but it's sort of been forgotten, and it really needs to be managed properly with fire to suppress these uh, tie tie plants. What are the other? It's long, and I don't see one real close, but it's sticky looking there. The um, one of the characteristics of these bogs is their carnivorous plants. In addition, of course, to the pitcher plants, which are carnivorous, this is uh, this particular little stem here is one of the species of Drosera, the sundew family. And whereas most of them have leaves that lie on the ground and, and are reddish and have little sticky globules at the end of little hairs on them, these send their leaves upward and have the stickiness. Watch this. You see how it sticks to my mm -hmm. finger? Look at the long real sticky uh, exudation here. My fly paper. You can actually see little flies and bugs trapped in this thing all along it. So this one reaches up into the air for its insects. 
when the hardwoods encroach on this bog, they're, they're changing it in two fundamental ways. First off, the herb nature of it is going to be destroyed by the shading. Uh -huh. the, the overstory will shade the ground and the grasses and the carnivorous plants will die. So that'll change, but something that the hardwoods do much more efficiently uh, and in greater volumes than the herb bog, they dry out the site by pumping the groundwater into the air through the process of evapotranspiration. So the hardwoods will and probably are eliminating the boggy nature of the site as witnessed by these plants. Um, what kind of animals are typical in this sort of a habitat? Because it's an intermediate stage, it's, it probably has nothing that, are, that is typical to it. Um, there, is the, there is an herb bog fauna and then a hardwood forest fauna, which will eventually uh, dominate here if this isn't knocked back. But the transitional state didn't occur very much probably in nature. And so you've got a blend in here of both uh, the uh, native bog, open bog animals and the hardwood community. The next step from here would be to look at what happens in a natural bog going back to the normal sequence and spreading out the slope, making the slope much, much more gradual. And when you do that, there aren't many places in the coastal plain that that happens, but close by in the Apalachicola National Forest, there are some classic spots. Okay. Let's go take a look okay, at let's it. let's do. This is one of our really super treasures in terms of the bogs of this region. It's absolutely stunning. This um, is called a savanna. It means a broad grassy plain with not many trees in it. Um, this particular savanna is a seepage bog and that usually you don't have the moisture in the standard savanna. But this one, notice the gradient here is just like the one that we saw before. To the left is the longleaf pine community, and what do we scare up? <laughs> Quail. Uh -huh. um, it, uh, it actually is a high hill, or a hill anyway, that has sand in it, which contains the rainwater that it captures uh, during rainfall. And that water moves down slope until it hits this grassy plain, and slowly, now we're only 30, 50, 40 feet but don't you ch already detect mm -hmm. the change? Mm -hmm. um, in fact, a few more steps, and you'll notice there's even some standing water. Why is this bog so broad, whereas the one we saw before was very narrow? Well, this one is kind of peculiar because the bog, if you dig down, it is not sandy underfoot. This, that is a difference here. It's silty. What you're looking at is an old, bed, an old channel of the Apalachicola River. Oh it my. used to flow over here. This is part of one of its old deltas. When it abandoned this channel, it still, during floodwaters, water would roar, rush over in here and fill up this basin and sit. Well, you know, turbid water has very fine silt particles in it. And as, um, we can keep walking down this gradient too, as that water evaporated, it left a little layer of silt. So eventually the whole channel became filled with silt, and as you can see, no sand in it, whatever. It's very, um, uh, almost like talcum. So what it does, it provides a, an impermeable layer that water slowly moves over the surface as sheet flow towards the, the bottom. The, the bed does have a low side to it. Way off on the right side, you'll see that that is a cypress community, and right in the foreground under it is that shrub bog environment that we saw. So the gradient and the whole transect that we looked at in a rather uh, compressed um, manner in our first stop now has been spread out because the slope is very gradual and then we have this unusual phenomenon of the old riverbed being the surface of the, the uh, grass bog here. Now there are, are there typical animals in this kind of habitat? as opposed to the one we saw that's in transition? Well, there not only are there animals, but again, there are a lot of interesting plants. Uh, these very often are particularly uh, well populated with orchids. We'll take a close-up look at some of those in a minute. 
And again, you see here, this is that Saracenia flava that uh, because the, the habitat for it is spread out, of course, it occurs in a much denser stand. But where would you expect to find the Cytocena, which Way likes it end. a little wetter? It's on that end. Um, we can uh, walk down this way. Oh, it's getting prepare sloppy. To, prepare to get a lot wetter. And the last thing we'll do is see one more example of a bog that has um, some other picture plants in it. And, and uh, that'll give us a, a look at as many as we can in a short period of time. Finally, among in this bog story, we're at a, a roadside ditch. <laughs> And it is not uncommon to see these interesting bogs along our ditches in Florida. This, um, this plant we're looking at is the fourth of the pitcher plant species we've seen today. This one's an extremely pretty one. It has these very large, um, almost Baroque leaves with a sort of a big frill around their opening of the mouth. You can really clearly see the hairs oh, here. Yes. And notice how much water they hold. Uh, they would no doubt have a lot more insect matter in them uh, in a short period of time than the other ones. This is Saracenia senia pure, purea, and we don't know a lot about this plant. And interestingly, that sort of draws attention to a, the main message I would like to leave about these bogs. They're very complicated. They're wetlands of high interest but we have a lot to learn about them. We're still sort of in a very early stage of understanding them. One last thing, just as we were coming down here, you know, we spotted this interesting snake, and I bring it out mainly because this, if ever were a bog snake, might be it. This is a king it's snake. Gorgeous. Notice it does not have the dark pattern with cross bands. And it is found just right here in this Apalachicola lowlands area uh, in the western part of the Nash Apalachicola National Forest. It does like these low, boggy areas. And I don't know, it, it's, it's very poorly studied, but um, it, it's associated with the savannas that we saw and this uh, purpurea bog. And very interestingly, maybe one of the animals you were asking about before that when we really learn about this animal and these bogs, we'll find a tighter association. Well, Bruce, thank you very much for showing us these wonderful landscapes here in Florida. I really have learned a lot today. Sure appreciate you coming out with us. Delighted, as always.